I really appreciate Eric stepping up. One of the things that I kind of like about our club is we we pull from a lot of different uh, venues or uh, avenues for speakers. Um, George does a great job pulling from academia and some of the NASA centers and whatnot. But I also like to bring club members in too uh, because uh, you know we have some incredible talent and skill sets and knowledge and. Uh, Eric is one of those. He's, I think, I think kind of late to the hobby, maybe more, more, more late than the rest of us, but boy, he has exceeded, um, you know, uh, what a lot would say uh, is, is an understanding of how your telescope mount works and how to squeeze out every little bit of performance uh, from it. So uh, I sat down with Eric and he kind of showed me um, how to, how to go about what he's going to describe to you. But um it's it's really super eric i appreciate you uh making the time for us here tonight and and putting this little presentation together eric's a recent retiree he spent a 35-year career at the naval research lab uh, he was the director of the institute for nanoscience as well as the head of the physics and electronics uh, materials branch so you know he's going from nanoscience to astronomy <laughs> i don't think there's a bigger span of, of size that you can get in a, in a person's, uh, you know, hobby and career. So uh, uh, just want to just want to thank you, Eric, and uh, we'll turn it over to you and uh, take it away. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Paul. That was a very kind introduction. And uh, I'll repeat a little bit of what you just said. I'll give you a, since I'm a fairly um, recent member, I joined Novak about a year ago. I'll give you a little bit of my background. As, as Paul said, I spent um, I recently retired from a 35-year uh, scientific career studying very small things, i.e. I, nanoscience, which is sort of the size of a billionth of a meter. And as I was anticipating retirement, I um, thought it might be interesting to take up, you know, the hobby of astronomy, where I can sort of appreciate uh, the universe on a much grander scale. Uh, I knew a lot about what happens at a small scale, and and uh, but not so much at a grand scale. So I joined Novak, which has um, been a great experience. Uh, the club is wonderful. There's lots of resources. I've um, you, <clears throat> there's so many experts. The talks are great at the monthly meetings. The uh, the uh, <clears throat> public viewing nights where you can look through all the equipment. I've really enjoyed it. And um, I also decided to take up the hobby of astrophotography. And uh, this, in spite of having no prior experience with astronomy, telescopes, or photography, but just uh, the thought that I can set up a small telescope in my, in my yard and pick up a few photons from some galaxy that was tens or hundreds of millions of light years away and, and capture an image just fascinated me. So um, I thought, even though I don't know anything about this, I'll, I'll try to set something up. And... Uh, and anybody that's gone through this process knows it's quite challenging. There's a huge learning curve you have to go through to set this up. And um, one of the bigger challenges I found was the, the mount itself. And um, both picking which one you're going to use and making it work well. And I ended up sort of picking a popular introductory mount, the Celestron AVX. And unfortunately, this was last winter when we were during the height of the pandemic when I ordered this. And and because of that, you know, there was a lot of manufacturing problems. And when it was delivered, it had lots of the manufacturing was, or the assembly was really poor in my mount. And, and from the outside, it looked great. But internally, there were all sorts of problems. And of course, being new to this, I didn't know if it was me, if it was the software, you know, I'm the guiding software I'm using or the mount itself. And I spent lots and lots of evenings in my front yard looking like this guy here, just puzzled look on my face, freezing cold. Uh, and I'm sure uh, any imagers out there have probably spent a few nights like this uh, and could appreciate the feeling. And um, eventually, I think, well, I got to get systematic of, the, of this if I remember going to get good use out of this. And I really started systematically trying to diagnose the problems and repair it and optimize the performance. And um, after I got finished with this, I, um, I realized that I had, <clears throat> that everything I had learned that I could have done in about one day. And it was this totally inefficient process that I had gone through, uh, you know, several weeks of trying to figure this thing out. But you could really collapse it down to about one day I could have done everything. 
and was talking to Paul about this a little bit and thought that this might be some useful information to share to other users, both beginners who want to know more about their, their mount and also experienced users who want to eke out a little bit of performance. So that's sort of how I, I got here and, and Paul and Alan Goldberg sort of convinced me to put something together. So this is the result of that. And so in this presentation, I'm going to assume you're sort of like uh, I was a year ago when you, you don't know a, an arc second from a right ascension. You just don't know anything. Um, you have no prior knowledge. And I'm going to walk you through sort of the fundamental understanding of how your mount works and, and particularly the source of any mechanical uh, and tracking errors in your mount. <clears throat> and that's important to know. And then I'm going to give you a sort of a simple process that you can use to diagnose your mount and figure out what the issues are with your mount. Uh, everyone's different. Every manufacturer is different. Uh, so, but there's some simple things you can do to sort of get an idea of where you, your mount could use some improvement. And then we'll develop a strategy to, to reduce those errors. And finally, when you're all done, um, you want to know, did I uh, do a good job of this? And I'll give you sort of a way to, to, to get a quantitative assessment of the performance of your mount. And then by the end, hopefully, you won't be like that guy on the last slide. You'll be like this guy confidently taking images, and your mount will be working perfectly. Uh, it's a high goal, but we'll, we'll shoot for it. All right. So let's go back to the beginning when you're starting to order your mount, and you probably went online like I did, and you uh, look for some advice. And I'm sure you've all run across this quote from uh, the founder of Astrophysics, and he says, the single most item, important item for the imager is the mount. Next comes the mount, then comes the mount. And so you quickly realize, well, the mount is an important piece of equipment. I better pay attention to it. And then you'll probably run advi across advice like this as well. And this person wrote, you know, you have two options. You can purchase an inexpensive mount, realize you made a mistake, and then buy a high-end mount, or buy a high-end mount up front and save yourself half the pain. And so then you do like I did, and you go on to the, some of the uh, sites to try to, to look up uh, a good mount to buy, and you find out that those high-end mounts are incredibly expensive. I mean, you could buy a used car for some of these things. And so um, either you can't afford that or you're reluctant to spend that much on a, on a new hobby. So, so you start getting a little critical, and you say, well, just how – how does mount performance going to affect my image resolution? You know, how important is this? And what sort of image quality uh, can I expect if I don't opt for a high-end mount? And is there anything I can do to, to improve the performance of whatever mount I, I do end up with? And uh, the good news is uh, we, what I found is with a little bit of maintenance and the right guiding strategies, you can take a a uh, moderately priced mount and produce some some fairly good images. So we'll sort of walk through how to do that. Uh, the first thing you need, we'll, just, so we'll, um, we'll go over how, how the mount works, what's the basic purpose of it. And basically, you're trying to capture an image of some very dim deep space object. Uh, you need to do long exposures with your camera on the order of minutes. And so you have to keep that, that object uh, perfectly steel in the frame of your camera. And so you need a, 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 a tripod and a mount that will track, track that object that will compensate for the rotation of the earth. And so the equatorial mount does just that. And it's very simple. You just point, uh, there's an axis of rotation called the right ascension axis. And you point that axis uh, along the axis of rotation of the earth in a process called polar alignment. And uh, after you've located the object, that, uh, that axis just rotates at exactly the right rate to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. And it keeps the object perfectly still in, uh, in your camera frame. And of course, to find that object, you also you can't just worry about the east-west movement from the uh, rotating around this axis. You also have to position it north-south. And so there's another axis of rotation uh, called the declination axis which can point you north and south to find the object. And then when you're tracking, after you found it, when you're tracking, the declination axis doesn't need to do a whole lot because it's fixed and the mount just slowly rotates, compensating for the rotation of the earth. And ideally that works perfectly and uh, everything's great. But in the real world, of course, 
<clears throat> nothing ever works perfectly. And uh, your polar axis may not be aligned quite right, or there could be some mechanical errors in the mount, which cause the rate to not be quite exactly what the earth is, or some wind could come along or whatever and can disturb this. And you need some help to keep that object perfectly still in the, in the view of the camera. So you help this along by using a small uh, additional camera to help guide the mount. And you can mount that other camera on a separate telescope or pick off part of the light of your main telescope. And then that small other camera takes very short exposures of order of a second or so and uh, use some software, uh, very good software that's free as PhD2, and it <clears throat> looks at the image in that second camera and it focuses on a, you know, a star in that image and it looks for any movement of that star. And if it sees any movement, then it'll issue a correction pulse back to the mount to put that star back in the position it should be. And that helps you keep that, that deep sky object uh, still in the frame of your main camera. And that works pretty well. And then the whole object of this is you really want to take this high resolution image um, and of this fuzzy uh, uh, <clears throat> dim object. And so we need to, to think about sort of what is the resolution of that image. And there's a term that a lot of people throw around that when I look on the web, people aren't familiar with what it actually is. And it's, so I'll just review it. And that's called the full width at half maximum. Um, and this is really trying to get a measure of the um, resolution in your image that if you take a, an image of a star, ideally, because that star is so far away, uh, the projected image on your camera should be less than a pixel in size. Uh, but it's not. When you actually measure the size of that star on your, in, in your camera, it will be several pixels in size. And, and by measuring the, uh, the size of that, that image, it gives you a good <clears throat> measure of the image uh, resolution in your camera because it should be a very tiny, it's not, and that's the measure of the resolution. And the way we quantify that is something called full width half maximum. So if you just drew a trace through a star, and so here's the background, and this is the intensity of light, and you go through a star, it'll go through a peak like that. And if you go to half the maximum value and measure the width, that gives you sort of the diameter of the star, and it's a measure of your resolution. And this has a nice property that no matter how bright or dim your star is, uh, you, all, <clears throat> you always get the same value. Unless, of course, you've, you've saturated the star and you, can't and you get clipped at the top and you can't measure the peak height. But as long as you can measure that peak height, just measuring that full width at half maximum gives you the resolution. Uh, of, of your image, of your imaging system. And of course, the, uh, the measure of that full width may be different in different directions. You might get oval looking stars. Um, and there's lots of reasons why you can do that. I mean, it can be that your scope is not collimated well, but also your mount can cause that. And, and for this talk, I'm only gonna talk about or refer to uh, your mount making sort of oval stars. The, the tracking errors are asymmetric in your mount. And so we can define the roundness with a little quantity looking at the difference in the two diameters of the two radii. And, and if that quantity round is, is less than 10%, your eye will perceive that star as round. So that's sort of a good, good eye, uh, quantity to keep in, in the back of your head is if we want to try to get very, very small round stars, uh, we can measure the full width at half maximum and we can measure this roundness factor and it gives us a quantitative idea of the resolution in, in the two directions. Now, Thomas Fowler, uh, uh, in a few, few um, months ago, gave us a very nice talk and educated us on sort of the factors that go into the resolution of your image. And uh, he talked about three elements. There's the optics, and I won't go over this in detail because uh, Tom did such a great job at this, but there's the optics, which is, proportional or inversely proportional to the diameter of your telescope. And for most imaging scopes, uh, this leads to a resolution from the optics, which is less than about an arc second. And that's due to the sort of the wave nature of light that limits the angular resolution. But if you use a, 
you know, reasonably large diameter scope, that's a very small value. And of course, that light from that star has to pass through the atmosphere and it has different temperatures and with different indexes of refraction and there's turbulence and it sort of moves that light beam around from, from that star. And that those fluctuations blur the image of the star. And for this area, that blurring usually results in the blurring of about one to three arc seconds. I track this on, the, I think there's a site Medio Blue and it predicts the scene and I rarely see it go below, below one uh, uh, seeing conditions here in this area and, and rarely does it get too much above three. So it's usually in that range of one to three. And then the third component that contributes to your uh, lack of or degradation of your resolution is the tracking errors of the mount that's itself and that's what we're dealing with tonight and you can get an estimate of that that when you're when you're guiding your scope it'll it'll print out uh at the bottom of the screen there'll be printed out sort of what the error it'll give you something called the root mean square error that's just a way of averaging the error that's what rms stands for and if you multiply that rms error by somewhere between two and two and a half it will give you an idea of how much um the tracking errors are contributing to the resolution of your image and and because this the optics is typically pretty small the seeing fluctuations you can't control the only one you can really control that's large are these mount induced errors and that's why you get this quote that the single most important item for the imager is the mount that's where that comes from um, now another thing tom did is he educated so how you combine you don't just add these there's a way you can combine this to get your final resolution and then what he showed us is that a couple of charts here that showed us how you could relate sort of uh, this is sort of empirical data you could relate sort of the tracking errors that are typical for mounts for uh, how much you you pay for them if you're going to get a high-end mount you can expect high quality components which will give you a, a low tracking area where if you if you purchase a mount like I did which was around a thousand dollars at the time you could expect much larger tracking errors and then he taught us how you could take that combine it with those other quantities and you could quantify the level of detail in your images and that's really what we're after in the end is what do our images look like and while this was numerical I thought it might be interesting to take that information and, and I'm a visual person and to see what that looks like. So what I did was I, you could start with a Hubble image and um, which has got a near ideal resolution because it doesn't have to pass through any atmosphere and it's a big diameter scope. And then you can blur that image with realistic optics. I used an eight inch SET for, for, for the optics I chose. And then you can add in realistic seeing conditions. So I added in one and a half arc seconds of seeing uh, blurring. And then you can <clears throat> look at that image for different tracking errors, different, different mount qualities, and see what sort of image degradation are you losing as you, as you go through different qualities of mounts. And the image I chose here was of uh, Messier 106. And here's the result of that. And here's the original Hubble image and a little blow up of the section here. And it's, this image doesn't do it, or this, uh, on my laptop doesn't do it justice. There's some really a lot of high, high resolution structure in this. But after we pass this light through our atmosphere, and we look at this with a high end mount, and I defined a high end mount where the, the mount errors are, are small compared to the seeing fluctuations, you get quite a bit of loss of resolutions from the atmosphere, and you can see that here. Um, now, if you drop down to sort of a mid range mount, you know, sort of in the three to $5,000 range mount, <laughs> the image is not degraded that much more. It's pretty, pretty similar. The, the amount of additional blurring is, is pretty small. And then finally, when you get to sort of the lower cost mounts, you can see that the, the image is now starting to lose quite a bit of resolution. And in fact, uh, you can start to see some of the R, uh, stars are getting oval shaped. And, and that's, and I'll talk about why that is, that there's an asymmetry in the way your mount produces error. Uh, and, and so this is sort of gives you an idea. Now, this is, no, this is a very high resolution. We're looking at a, at a field of view here that's only about, you know, a few arc minutes by a few arc minutes. But 
uh, on a small field of view, this is the type of a blurring you can get from various sort of quality mounts. So looking at that, we say, well, there's a small difference between a high end and a mid, mid, mid range mount for the seeing conditions around here. And there's a perceptible difference between going from a mid range to a low end mount, and at least for small fields of view. And then it becomes a value judgment that you can make to decide whether or not that expense is, is worth it to uh, whether you want to invest in a mid or high end mount to get the, the best resolution. And, I, and <clears throat> by the way, there are lots of other reasons besides image resolution to, to, to select a, a higher end mount. They have lots of nice features and I'm not gonna to dwell on those. This is really just focusing on image quality. But what I'm gonna talk about tonight is there's another sort of a less expensive alternative is you can take the mount you have if you select not to go with one of these higher end mounts and you can optimize it and get some really pretty good performance out of that. And, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. <clears throat> um, but before I do that, we need to understand a little bit more about guiding. We have to understand about how seeing affects the guiding and what the source of tracking areas are. So let's look at guiding in a little more detail. Um, so basically we've got this, this small little cheap camera that's taking uh, short exposures typically of order a few seconds and we'll call that exposure time dt and then there's this software phd2 that's looking at an image of a star taken by that camera and it looks for a movement of that star away from where it's supposed to do we'll call that quantity error or error and then the software will generate a correction signal that goes back to your mount and that correction signal will be proportional and opposite to the error. And the proportionality of constant, I'll call something called the aggressiveness. This is how aggressively you want to correct the errors. And that can be anywhere from sort of zero to one. Actually, in PhD2, it's in percent. It goes from zero to 100. But for this purpose, we'll just say it goes from zero to one, where zero is no correction and one is a full correction. So basically, <laughs> there's lots of guiding algorithms in PhD2, but they basically boil down to the fact that you have an exposure time which you can control and a level of aggressiveness, aggressiveness that you can control and how to, how to make those errors. And that's really all we need to know about, about guiding. And we can optimize those two for our system and our seeing conditions. Now, let's look a little bit more at this, the seeing. Now, we already discussed, and I wanted to go over it again, that the, for this area, the typical seeing conditions give a broadening of somewhere between one or blurring of one to three arc seconds of our stars. But there are a couple of other interesting things we need to know about seeing. One is that the time scale over which these uh, blurring and fluctuations occur, and they're pretty rapid, tens to hundreds of milliseconds. And here's an image of a star passing through our atmosphere, and it's fluctuating very rapidly and looking something like this. Now, when you take a long exposure, you average out that out and just looks like a blurred image, but on a rapid scale of tens to hundreds of milliseconds, it's actually doing this. So we need to know what this time scale is. And the other thing you need to know is that these fluctuations are uncorrelated across your field of view. That what's in here, you can see that with this high resolution image of the moon, and you can see, and it's going through seeing fluctuations, you can see that what's going on in one part of the image is not the same thing that's going on in another part of it. And the implications of these is that you've got this unpredictable image blurring, which is on a very fast time scale, that you cannot correct. <clears throat> uh, even if you could correct it with some adaptive optic, optic system, you could only correct it on a small scale in your image that the rest of your image would be blurred. You could get maybe one sharp star or a double star or something like that, but the rest of your image would blur. So we can <clears throat> rule out trying to correct seeing fluctuations with our mount. So really, since we can't correct them, what we really want to do is to make sure that they don't interfere with our ability to correct the real things, which are the mount errors. And so we can develop a strategy then on our guiding to sort of minimize the effects of seeing on, on, uh, on our ability to correct the mount errors. So, and there are two things that we can do. One, you can use long 
guide exposure times. Instead of around a second, you can go to several seconds. And that long exposure time serves sort of like a low pass filter and it averages out some of those very rapid fluctuations and you get sort of a steadier image that you can then more easily detect uh, uh, fluctuations caused by your or errors caused by your mount. Um, the other thing you can do is to use sort of moderate aggressive values. And the reason for that is if you set that aggressive aggression setting up near one, you can show that you will actually create additional image, additional noise in, in your image. That, and this is what's called chasing the scene. That uh, as that star zigs and you try to make a big correction to it, it zags and, and you're always following way behind and you're actually creating more noise than was there originally. So the two things that we can do are use long exposure times and we can use moderate K values. And that's the conventional wisdom that if you look online, that's what it will tell you to do. And that works really well if you have a high performance mount, which has a low level of mechanical error. But this is not the best strategy if your mount has a large mechanical error. And here we have to do a compromise. We have to <clears throat> err on the side of the mechanical error and maybe sacrifice some of the additional noise that we're going to introduce in the scene. So let's see why that is. So now let's, let's, let's focus on our mount for a second. And this is, uh, I have a Celestron AVX. And this, by the way, this presentation is not specific to this particular style of mount. It's, it's, it, it's fairly universal. Uh, I'm just using the pictures of my mount because it's convenient. But um, so this is uh, how most mounts work is that if you there's um, if you take off a little cover somewhere you'll find there's a, a little electric motor a stepper motor which drives the rotation uh, of each of the two axes the right ascension axis and the declination axis and usually on that small motor if you took the, the lid off of it you would see uh, a little gearbox in there and the purpose of that is basically your stepper motor when you're tracking is rotating around mine rotates about every 10 seconds and this sort of gears down that rotation so by the time the rotation comes out of that gearbox out to these little brass spur gears out here you've lowered the rotation to right where these rotate on the order of about several hundred seconds it's 600 seconds in my mount and then this spur gear drives what's called the worm gear. And this is a very important gear. And it's hidden under this little case here. And it will be hidden because you don't want to get any dust or anything or any grit in there. But if you take it off, it looks something like that. And it's really just like a screw. It's got a little spiral or helical grooves cut in it. Uh, when this motor drives these spur gears, it rotates this. And then this is meshed with the worm wheel, which is here. And as this rotates, it pushes this uh, worm wheel around such that it rotates about uh, or exactly every 24 hours. It, it follows the rotation of the earth. So it's just, and it's a very simple system. And there's, you know, a few parts in here that you have to lubricate and smooth, but here's all the action. It's just, there's a little motor, a couple of gears. This might be a belt drive in yours instead of a, a spur gear but there's just a few gears that drive this worm well. It's, it's actually a very simple system. But looking at this, we can see that there are gonna be several different types of errors that's gonna interfere with our tracking of this deep sky object. There, first, there are external problems, and we're not gonna talk about those very much because they're not, about, they're not mount specific. These are, are, are problems just in general that you need to take care of before you start worrying about what's going on inside the mount. You can have, you know, if you've got a complicated imaging system like that, you can get snagged cables, there could be wind gusts, there can be, you know, you can forget to tighten down your, your imaging scope, all sorts of things that will lead to, to tracking errors. And you have to eliminate those first. So that's your first order of business. And then what you're left with are sort of internal parts now. And I'm going to classify those into two sets. One, there are sort of intrinsic problems 
that are deal or because you have sort of nine ideal parts in your thing. And these are things you cannot fix. And so our only solution to get rid of those is, is to use guiding or clever guiding algorithms. The other type uh, of error can be maintenance issues. And these are sort of fixable problems. We can go in and something we can actually fix and those we can address with mount repair. And you can sort of see, just looking at the pictures here, what sort of problems we might have. That you can see that the parts here are not the highest quality parts. These are plastic gears, and this is a highly precise instrument here. I mean, you're trying to, to track objects with sub arc second precision, and you've got sort of plastic gears driving it. Uh, you can see that that's going to introduce all sorts of, uh, uh, of errors that we're going to have to correct. And in a part like this, you can see that these are this <clears throat> the shaft goes down in here and it rotates and there could be sort of debris in here that can cause friction these these are closely meshed surfaces and and that can lead to problems so these are the kind of problems we we're going to have to address either with guiding or with mount repair so let's first let's look at those internal sources of tracking error these are the ones we can't fix and basically we've already seen that we've got these sort of uh fairly inexpensive gears, at least in the lower end mounts. I'm sure the higher end mounts use a better, better, higher precise, higher precision gears, and they use better designs. But as you go down, this, this is what you're paying for, basically, when you go to a high end mount. As you go to the mid and lower end, you're going to get less expensive parts. And so you can expect that those gears are going to vary. There are going to be variations in size and how they're shaped, the details of the shape, and also how they position, how accurately they're positioned in the system. And right away, you can see that that's going to lead to variations in the rotational rate of these. It might speed up a little bit or slow down a little bit because they're not quite circular. They're a little oval shaped. Uh, some of the teeth might be too big and you're going to get binding where there's sort of like strong mechanical forces that keep this from rotating smoothly. Or the teeth might be too small or they might be spaced too far <clears throat> so that when uh, if you the tooth is too small in here. And while it's fine and pushing it in one direction, when you try to reverse it, uh, it's not meshed up against the gear behind it. And it takes a little while before it comes back and, and, and moves the gears in the other direction. And that's called backlash. So, and you can, you can certainly buy high quality trans. It's like buying, you can buy a Swiss watch, which is very expensive, but it has a very good movement in it. But if you buy a Timex, you're going to expect that, that the, 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 the gear system is not the, the highest of quality. And that's how they keep the costs low. And that's going to lead to, to problems. Now, the most serious of those three problems is binding. And the reason is if the binding is too bad, this creates tremendous elect, uh, mechanical forces in here, a lot of strain, and it could snap one of those plastic gears or it could, it could uh, burn out your, your motor. So the manufacturers know that, so they build slop into your system. They're going to intentionally undersize the teeth so that they don't bind up, or they're going to position them so that they're not closely meshed. So there's, they're going to introduce, and all that's going to come at the cost of introducing backlash into your system. So you can guarantee up front when you buy one of the lower cost systems that you're going to expect it's going to have variations in rotational rate, and that's called periodic error. And the reason for that is because that error in that gear is going to repeat. Every time it goes around, it's going to speed up and slow down periodically. You're going to see it over and over again as it goes around. And you're also going to expect it's going to have a fair amount of backlash in it because we're trying to avoid the, the killer, which is binding. So we can anticipate this in our system. What we need to do is a way to measure this. And we can do that quite easily. Now, where we worry about periodic error is in our right ascension axis. That is the one that's compensating, that's always moving, compensating for the rotation of the Earth. And that is spinning at the rate of, it's called the sidereal rate, once every 24 hours. And those flaws and all those gears are going to create that periodic error I'm talking about. And you can assess that for your mount very simply. And the way you do that, is you balance your mount, load it up with your telescope, calibrate it, point it somewhere near the celestial equator, and start it tracking a star using PhD2. 
And then what you want to do is to turn off the uh, guide outputs. There's a, a little thing you can click in PHD2 and it will turn off the guide outputs. Alternatively, you could just turn those aggressive settings down to zero, either way. And basically then PHD will record the error in your mount, but it won't put out any guide pulses to, um, to compensate for that error. And you can see what the true performance of your mount is that way. And that's very useful information that we can use on figuring out how to guide it. Um, and this is what you're going to see. And this is my mount. This is a curve for my mount. And you can see that there's this sort of periodic sign-like looking curve, which has a period of about 600 seconds, 10 minutes. That's the period of one, one rotation of that, of that worm gear. It rotates every 600 seconds. And so that error repeats every 600 seconds. And you can see it's quite large for my mount. It's like 40 arc seconds from, from minimum to maximum. Now, I'm going to refer to this in a minute. When you talk about an amplitude of a sine wave, it's half this value. So I'm you're going to show you a chart in a minute where this is going to be 20 arc seconds. And that's because I'm talking about the amplitude. But the peak or the trough to the, to the, uh, to the peak is 40 arc seconds for that. And that's what my mount looks like. So it's a quite large area. Clearly, you're not going to track accurately stars without some guiding with this. The other thing you'll notice is that these are sort of rapid oscillations. And just looking at that, you don't know if, this are, if these are seeing fluctuations or if this is some other periodic error. But there's a way we can tease that out. And there's a free app. You can go on, download it, <clears throat> and it's called PhD Log Viewer. So when you record, when you take this, uh, with uh, PhD2, anytime you you go through a, 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 a guiding session, it saves that guide log onto your computer. You may not know it, but it's saved on there. And then if you <clears throat> download this app, you can the next morning go in and you can download that guide log and it will analyze it for you. And it will help you pick out whether these sort of wiggles in here, or these are seeing fluctuations or if this is some periodic error from our gears. And this is what, when you do that, this is what it looks like. You'll get an output that looks something like this graph here. And what this is showing on this axis, this is the axis, this is the amplitude of your error. And along the, the, the horizontal axis, this is the time scale or the period of that error. So it's done a frequency analysis and it's only picked out things that are periodic. It's gotten rid of all the random fluctuations and it's just picked out the periodic errors in your, <clears throat> in your mount. And here is that peak, that big, big sine wave that we looked at. Remember I mentioned the amplitude was half the peak to valley and that's 20 arc seconds. So it's got an amplitude around 20 arc seconds and the period is around 600. So this is a log scale by the way on the time. So it's got about a 600 second period and an amplitude of about 20 arc seconds. And then you see these other little peaks down here and they don't look very impressive compared to this one, but they're actually quite important. And I even blew up this section down in here, blew it up here so you could see these additional peaks. And I happen to be able to find a diagram of all the gears in my mount and all their periods and stuff. You don't need to do this and you may not be able to find it for your mount. I just did it out of curiosity for my mount and you can find, you can take every one of these peaks and you can trace it back to one of those gears in that gearbox. And, and because they're not very high quality, they all give you errors. And so this is going to be extremely useful information. I encourage you to do this because you can use this now to figure out a guide strategy to try to get rid of this. And, and you're going to have to get rid of this to get high performance in your imaging or high performance in your mount and allow you to take high resolution images. So let's first worry about that big, long 600 second periodic error. And it's gonna be, in for all mounts, it's gonna be pretty long. It may not be 600, it may be a few hundred seconds. And it's there in, all, in every mount. High quality mounts is gonna be much smaller, but it's there in every mount. Um, and because of that, um, both your mount, and the software have good ways of getting rid of that. And basically the way it works is that you set up, and it's called periodic error correction. 
And the way it works is you set up a guiding section session with your mount, get it tracking the star. And with the guide pulses now activated, so it's trying to make the corrections. And then there's typically sort of a record button in your mount on that little handset. And it will record the corrections that your, uh, that your guiding program is doing. It will record those. <clears throat> uh, and it, it records then how you fix this with your guide program, how you tried to get rid of this. And then when you're doing a, an imaging session, you can play that back. And the mount itself will try to fix at least some of this periodic error. And that's very useful. So you want to do that. And that's a, it, it's a straightforward process. It's described in the manual to your mount. In addition, the guiding program itself, PhD, has a mode called predictive periodic error correction. And it, error correction. And it does pretty much the same thing that you start tracking um, and it remembers the corrections it's making and it looks for a periodicity that and after a couple of periods it will start to proactively or predictively making those corrections uh, for you and it doesn't uh, it's not react it's not reacting in real time it's actually predicting what's going to happen and depending on the level of periodic error in your mount you can use one either of these or both of them for a, a mount which has a lot of periodic error like mine i use both of those in combination both I, I i record the error and in my mount and then i play that back and then i also use the predictive pec guide algorithm in phd2 and both of those together can just almost completely eliminate that and that's important because now your guiding can just focus on trying to get rid of these rapid oscillations. And they can actually be a much harder problem and, and important for getting that last little performance out of your mount. So now let's take a look. So we've gotten rid of the long period. So now let's focus on those more rapid oscillations. Uh, the By the way, your, your mount periodic error correction and PHD2 won't correct for those. It's only going to correct for that longest period. It doesn't look at these shorter period oscillations. You've got to do that with guiding. Now, <clears throat> one thing we it's important to realize is that the difficulty in guiding these out is proportional to the rate of change of the error, how fast that error is occurring. And you can get an estimate of how uh, what that rate of change is by taking the amplitudes of each of those peaks and dividing them by the period. And that gives you the size of the oscillation divided by how, how often it occurs, gives you sort of an estimate of the rate of change. And you can look for the maximum from all those peaks. It may not be, it may not be the biggest peak that's the biggest problem in terms of the one that's hardest to guide out. But if you take that ratio and you just sort of pick it out for each of your peaks, you can identify which of those peaks is the one that's going to be the hardest to guide out. And then if you can guide that out, you've taken it out, but you've also taken out all the other peaks because they're going to be easier. And for my mount, it's this peak right here, which has about an amplitude of one arc second, and it's around 19 seconds is the period. And if you do that ratio, that's the one that, that's the most problematic for my mount. And, and you'll have a different one for your mount, but you, you want to figure that one out. Then we can figure out what sort of guiding parameters, the exposure time and the aggressiveness to take that out using sort of this relationship that I developed. And first off, you want to know <clears throat> to figure that out, what sort of uh, resolution are you trying to achieve? In, 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 in my case, I want to get the error much less than the typical scene fluctuations. So for this area, that's about one and a half arc seconds. So I want my error to be much smaller than that. Uh, the period of my peak is uh, 20 seconds or 19 seconds. The amplitude is about one arc second. And depending on what aggressiveness, if you take that quantity and you divide it by 50, it will give you, uh, for whatever aggressiveness level you choose to use in your guiding, it will tell you what sort of time scale you need to do for your exposures. So I like to use a high aggressiveness level. I used to use around 80% or 0.8 or so. It's near one. And if you stick that in, 
it tells you that in order to get rid of this and all the other peaks, I need an exposure time around a half second if I want to get errors that are much smaller than that one and a half arc second seam condition. So you've taken this, and this is a way you can tell for your mount, you'll get different numbers, how aggressive you need to do. Now, you've probably picked up on something here that the mechanisms for getting rid of this periodic error are exactly opposite of what we said to do if you want to minimize seeing effects on your guiding. They're sort of, uh, in one case, you want to use long exposure times and you want to use moderate aggressiveness. But in order to get rid of these rapid pulses or rapid oscillations in the gears, we need to use very short exposure times and high aggressiveness. And that's the dilemma you face that uh, when you're, and, and, and it comes to be uh, then to be a compromise. Um, and if you have a very high performing mount, which has got a low amount of mechanical error, you certainly want to go towards the long exposure times in the moderate K. But if you have a mount like mine, which has a lot of periodic error that's very large and very rapid, I'm going to have to err on the side of short exposure times and high aggressive. And this was sort of the state, the compromise that you had to reach sort of about a year ago. But PhD last winter came out with a new feature called multi-star guiding. And that sort of changed the game here. And how does that work? Well, <clears throat> remember what I said at the beginning about seeing that the motion uh, of the seeing and or the fluctuations in seeing across your image are uncorrelated from one part to the other. So while the normal guiding picks out one star and tries to track it, in multi-star guiding, uh, PhD will actually pick out a bunch of stars and sort of look at the center of mass of all those stars and try to track that. And because they're uncorrelated, they're all zigging and zagging in opposite directions, you sort of get an averaged effect, which is the fluctuations are much smaller than any one individual star. In fact, it goes as sort of the square root of the number of stars you pick. And I think PhD2 will go up to tracking about nine stars. So if you track nine stars <clears throat> and you take the average position of those, the seeing fluctuations are going to reduce by about a factor of three. And that's a game changer in trying to work with these sort of high uh, mechanical error mounts is because now we can go back and we can use these high aggressiveness settings without much penalty. And we can really get rid of those mechanical errors. And that was a real, and Paul, I think Paul, uh, for, for bringing this, I didn't know about this feature. And he pointed it out to me. And as soon as he said it, it was like a light bulb went off. And I said, yeah, that's the key to getting performance out of my mouth. And there's a lot of misconception when I read about this on, online that this does not, in any way affect the seeing in your image. As we pointed out, that's, that's unfixable. But what it does is it reduces that seeing so that you can guide and <clears throat> much more accurately and, and correct for those mount errors. And that's the, that's the real advantage of that. And when you add that in, this really works quite well. And here's the result for my mount. So this is before we've, uh, if you remember this curve, these are the amplitudes of the various errors of the various gears. Remember the scale here was at about 20 arc seconds. And now I'm going to turn on those aggressive guiding things and record and then do the analysis in PhD2. And now you can see that the scale is no longer 20 arc seconds, it's one arc second. So I've reduced the scale here by a factor of 20. And you can see there's just some very few small peaks left. And no one of these peaks is greater than 0.15 arc seconds and amplitude, where here we, we started around 20, now we're down where every peak is less than 0.15. So by using this multi-star guiding and aggressive guiding settings with the right parameters, you can basically take that low performance, high mechanical error amount and turn it into a very high performance amount. And that's the real uh, advantage we have now with multi-star guiding. Now, that's for the right ascension, <laughs> which um, 
I said that that's always moving in one direction. And so with that, we don't have to worry about backlash. Now, our declination axis, because uh, backlash is the other problem we have to correct for. And in the declination, it's a different issue. Remember that we can expect that our gears are going to have a lot of backlash. Uh, but in the declination axis, we're trying to, it's not really moving in any one particular direction because that's sort of fixed. And we're just trying to correct for the fact that our uh, polar alignment is not very good or there's a wind gust that comes along or, or whatever. And it can be often caused direction, uh, corrections in both directions. And if you do that with a lot of backlash, it, it'll just sit there and it won't do anything for a long time. And but this is really pretty simple to overcome. And the really what you want to do for this is you really want to primarily guide in one direction. And it's really easy to do that is you just don't do a really good job uh, polar aligning your system. You just use a little bit of slight misalignment when you polar align, and it will cause the deck axis to slowly drift in one direction. And I find it sort of optimal if it drifts on the order of sort of one to five arc seconds per minute. And this way you're only making a few corrections per minute, but if it ever drifts, in, an, in a direction where there's backlash, it will drift back because of this sort of intrinsic misalignment of the polar axis. And I don't go out and intentionally try to set this. I just don't do the best job setting my, um, my uh, polar alignment when I set it up. And this is typically what it ends up to be, and this turns out to work quite well. So I don't really don't even think about the declination axis very much. And then when you Want to do this? You use uh, something called a resist switch mode in PhD, which permit uh, per, uh, tries to prevent overcorrections and use only very moderate aggressiveness. And when you do this, your your guiding will only go and it will make only a few corrections in one direction, and, and you're great. And you can also, if you want to, you can enable a backlash compensation in PhD2, or actually try to measure the backlash in your system and compensate for it for you. And that's that's useful as well. And if you just do that, sort of the, the declination axis takes care of itself. And with sort of minimal corrections, your your deck, your deck error is going to be pretty much near seeing limited because there's not too much mechanical going on. So it's a pretty simple. The, re, the right ascension axis is where we have to think a little harder. So that's that's the, those are the sort of the intrinsic errors and have to, how we correct those. Now we need to worry about the sort of mount maintenance, the things that we need to fix. And these, men like those periodic errors, these are more intermittent, intermittent errors, and they can be quite large. And you're guiding along, and all of a sudden you see these big glitches or your RA starts spiking. These are sort of signs that there's something going on in your mount that you need to repair. And this can be very intermittent. You know, one night you can see not see this at all. And then you can come back the next night and they'll be all over the place. Or in the middle of one imaging session, these can come and go. And that's a sure sign that you've got some sort of excessive friction or stiction inside your mount. And your mount will really, it really handles well sort of constant forces. If it's not balanced real well or there's constant friction, it handles that really well. But sort of changing friction or stiction, it doesn't handle well at all. And it'll give you these large errors. And primarily, I'm going to sort of <clears throat> tell you that, that primarily this is not just poor grease or something. It really primarily comes from, from binding in your worm gear. And that's really where you want to focus trying to get this out. And we'll, and we'll talk about the minute. But it could also be something There could be grit or metal shavings down in your mount or or there's some wear or poor lubrication, but we're going to, we need to sort of identify this and get rid of this if we're going to hope to get good guiding. Even if we've got the periodic error, we've got these sort of random errors we also need to take care of. And the way I found it is, and it's just by trial and error, the one that really works and it works every time is you need to feel what the motor feels. I've tried all ways of diagnosing them out, but this really works. And <clears throat> What you do um, is load up your mount, and you want to you want to you want to try to feel what's going on when your mount is fully loaded with your mount. And it's all balanced, and you've got the full weight of your mount because it can be different, quite different when it's unloaded. So you load it up, and you remove that cover, and you expose your uh, 
your little drive motor and, and the gears attached to it, or this could be a belt drive. And then you lock your clutch down because <clears throat> we want this rotation of the gears now to drive the telescope around. And then you want to disengage this worm gear from your motor because it won't rotate with this in place. You can't rotate it by hand. So in my mount, it's very simple. There's just a couple of grub screws. You take those off and this the little gear will slip off. And now you can freely turn this with your hand. Uh, alternatively, you can just slide the motor over or you can just loosen these so this will spin and you can spin this one. There are lots of ways. But anyway, you want to just, and if you've got a belt, you take the belt off. What do you do? But you want to get where you can rotate this by hand. And then you just start rotating. And you have to rotate this until the, the telescope goes complete 360 degrees. And that's really literally well over 100 rotations uh, of this. This takes a while. So you just sit there and you spin this. And what you're doing is you're feeling for any little uneven friction that comes along. And anytime that you feel something uneven, that's a source of tracking errors. And you've got to get rid of it. And, and this is the best way I've found for, for identifying those little places where there's some excess friction. You just sit there and you can feel it when it's clear as day. Paul has done this in my garage and he could feel them in his hand. And then you can go in and then you can try to fix them. Now, the most likely source of this, and this is just an intrinsic property of worm gears, is that the most likely source of those little friction is that your worm gear is binding with your worm wheel. And there's a reason for that. And I don't, I, I don't understand fundamentally why this is, but when they machine these worm wheels, it is really hard so that, and you get this spinning on an axis so that they're, and you mesh closely this worm gear to it, it's extremely hard to engineer that so that there are no high spots in the worm wheel. So that while you can mesh that worm gear with it, great at one spot, you rotate to another spot and you hit a high spot and the worm wheel will start binding with the worm gear. And it can only be just a couple of few places. And that's why this air is often very intermittent on that entire worm wheel. And it takes hundreds of rotations to go fully around. So finding it, you know, if you're a manufacturer, it takes time to go rotate that around and find all those, the highest high spot. But that's what you need to do. So <clears throat> basically, you go through and you start rotating your, your, your uh, worm gear around and you feel a little bit of friction coming on, a little bit excessive friction. And then there are going to be some adjustment screws which control the spacing and every mount is going to be different. You have to look online. I'm sure this is online for your mount. This is what it looks like for mine. There's some adjustment screws which control the spacing between the worm wheel and the wor uh, worm gear and the worm wheel. And you just back that off a little bit as soon as you feel that friction. And if the friction goes away, you know, hey, that was the problem. And then you can keep going till you find the next high spot, back it off a little more until you can go all the way around without hitting any, finding any excessive friction. And then you know you've gone over the highest high spot. And at that point, you've eliminated all the little stiction places for your worm wheel. And this works really well. And you have to do it for both axes, both the declination and the right ascension. And this takes a few hours, or not, not a few hours, it takes you know, 30 minutes or so per axis to rotate that around and find that. Now, it's possible that that won't fix it. <clears throat> if you find a sort of resistive spot, and you say, ah, oh, there's some friction here, you back this off and it doesn't go away. Well, now you know it's not between here, your worm gear, and, and your worm wheel it has to be something internal in here. And you, you've located that it's not out here, it's in here somewhere. So now you gotta do a little extra surgery and, uh, and, and take this apart. And this is really just a few screws taking these apart. You probably wanna take some pictures so you know how it goes back together. It's not brain surgery. You can take these apart and look in here and just by visual inspection, you can probably find out what was causing that additional friction that wasn't but this is sort of unlikely to occur. I had this in my mount because it was a terrible mount when I got it. There were metal shavings collected down here. When the guy machined this, he didn't clean out the metal shavings. That was causing me friction. They had banged this against something sharp, the worm wheel, and there was a big gouge in here. Uh, 
that had some protrusions on it and that was creating friction. So I had to sand that off. But that hopefully is pretty unusual that I really got a lemon mount that was, like I said, manufactured during the, epi during the epidemic. And hopefully yours won't be like that. So the chance of finding in something is, is unlikely. It's most likely those friction points are between your worm gear and your worm wheel. But when you're in here, you might as well re-lubricate re it. I use, you know, high quality grease and things like that. Uh, you can clean out these grooves if you want, whatever other sort of maintenance. If, if once you've got it apart, you might as well do a little bit of maintenance on it. But most likely, you're not going to have to do that. Any issues you're finding are going to be out here. But this system works. Uh, uh, it's easy, and uh, it will identify those, those things. So now you've gone through this. You fixed the periodic error. You fixed your maintenance issues. Did you do good enough? How, how good is good enough? And remember, our goal was sort of seeing, limiting it, seeing limited images with imperceptible tracking errors. And we can develop then a criteria to develop uh, to evaluate how much error is in your session. And it's pretty easy to do. I sort of came up with this idea, which is basically is at the beginning of your image session, take a few short exposure of star images, you know, one to three seconds. And the reason for this is you want to get this time sort of small compared to your any error in your mount uh, but long compared to those rapid seeing fluctuations and this will give this is long enough so that your seeing fluctuations are sort of averaged out you're getting sort of an average blurring but you're not running into mount errors and you measure that you know, i usually take about 10 frames somewhere around a second exposure and i <clears throat> uh, use an app which gives me the, the full width half maximum. And then that's going to be all caused by any scene fluctuations or any optics. It may be unfocused or, or lack of collimation, but it gives you sort of what your, the outside uh, of your mount is doing. Now, what you want then during your long exposures is you don't want to add any additional error, ideally. And here's sort of a, a, a little uh, inequality that you can use to evaluate whether the tracking errors are contributing anything beyond that, that sort of seeing level that you measured from the short exposure. So now you do your long exposures. You take that full width half maximum you've got from the short exposures, divide it by four. So let's say you got uh, you know, two <clears throat> arc seconds here. You divide that by four. That's a half arc second. Then if your sort of RMS right ascension error is less than that half arc second and your deck error is less than your rms and that's going to be a given because this is going to have your mount error this is not going to have any mount error and this is just purely seeing if you've done it right if you meet this condition then you'll get round stars at least round from the perspective of your mount you might have other reasons that aren't round but this will give you round stars that are seeing limited so if you can meet this condition, you've known you've done the best you can do, and your images are now seeing limited, and your mount is not contributing to any of the problems. And so I often use that. And here's an example with my mount. Now, and I'm imaging it at a long focal length of, uh, with, uh, with an 8-inch SET using an off-axis guider on my, on my uh, inexpensive little AVX mount. And here's 100 subs that I took. Uh, in one evening, and for each of those sub uh, subs, I measured uh, the full width half maximum of, uh, uh, of the star in each of those subs, and also recorded the tracking error during during each of those. Actually, Nina, uh, the the guiding post, does this for you, and then I plotted it on this chart. And for that evening, when I did those short exposures. Uh, to get the seeing, I got about 2.3 arc seconds. That was the optics and seeing limited uh, uh, of my particular system. And then <clears throat> if I put that into this condition now, then a quarter of that 2.3 is 0.5 second arc seconds. The average RMS for all of the, uh, all of the subs I did, for all 100 subs uh, on the R axis was 0.46 arc seconds and the deck was about 0.27, so it met this condition. So this should give me seeing limited um, uh, and round stars. And here's, I stacked, I didn't throw out anything, and those 100 subs, stacked them all, 
and uh, didn't stretch the data. Just here's some pictures of some stars of that image, and you can see that they are indeed small and and <clears throat> and at the resolution, uh, so they're sort of seem limited. And so if you can meet this condition, and this gives you an idea whether you've done a good job in 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 maintaining your mount and 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 doing the tracking. So that's that's a something you can use that's that's a value and tell you where you're getting the most out of your mount. So that's basically what I had to say this evening. I hope it's been uh, useful. Um, if and so the final suggestions is if you're um, if you're willing to put in a little time and effort, I think you can take even a, a a fairly low performance mount like mine and get high resolution image. Um, basically, it's a two step process. You do a little do uh, an unguided error analysis. that will take you one evening to get your guide parameters for your periodic error. And then you want to know the next day, you go in and rotate your worm gear around, figure out where if you've got any stiction or friction problems, fix those, and then you're good to go. Just don't overload your mount. I don't, uh, my mount's rated at 30 pounds. I never go over about 20 pounds. I use multi-star so you can reduce those seeing effects, guide your deck, mostly unidirectional. And then if you can achieve this, your image resolution is as good as the seeing conditions will allow, and you've done your job. And the reasons you might want to consider higher end mounts is if you want hands off operation, you know, I, I, I pay attention closely what's going on in mine. If you want to do unguided imaging, clearly you can't do that with a mount like mine. If you want to do heavy loads, uh, then you might want to invest in a mount that has, I didn't mention this, spring loaded or magnetically loaded worm gear, because that gets around that binding problem, which is uh, a real problem with, with worm gears. If you spring load them instead of rigidly loading them like my system, or magnetically load them, it'll float right over those high spots. And that's a feature, if I had to do it again and to buy a mount, I would probably look for a spring-loaded or magnet magnetically loaded worm gear. And with that, I'll stop and uh, entertain questions. Hey, th thanks, Eric. That was terrific. Um, and uh, I can attest to Eric, uh, Eric's techniques. I mean, he helped me out a lot with uh, finding ways to improve things. And uh, Unfortunately, I had already put an order in for a little better mount at the time I talked to Eric, so uh, I'm using that now. But I know that I have an EVX too that uh, that works much better than when I got it out of the box too. So um, we do have some questions. Let me go through the chat box and we'll get right to it. Um, Michael Brock, you raised your hand, so let's go to you first uh, and you can ask your question. Well, thanks very much, and thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank uh, you. And I wonder, um, you had one of your slides showed a graph that uh, basically had seemingly separated out the random errors caused by stiction from the periodic um, errors caused by uh, gear anomalies. Uh, was that generated from an app, or how, how did you get that? I, I, I'm sorry, are you talking about um, Whoops, this? Yeah, no, you you went right by it there. Right, this 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 graph like this. Uh, no, <laughs> it was it had a red line and a blue line. Oh, this one. That ah, there you go, green. Oh, okay. No, this is just this is just a a guide log of my mount before I fixed it, and this is what it looked like. You can see the this was typical that I had. Um, so the green curve is the RA error, and the red curve is the deck axis. And this is just the error uh, recorded while I'm guiding it as a function of time. And you can see back when I first got my mount, my uh, total error was around 2.3 arc seconds. And I had these huge glitches. I had lots of periodic error. I didn't know what I was doing. The mount had all kinds of had metal shavings in it, and I got all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, so this is just a, a guide log from PhD2. That's what this is. So, so the two different colors represent the two different axes of your map? That's correct. The, the, the green is the RA and the red is the, it records them both at the same time. And when you see these sort of large glitches, that's when you know uh, you've got some stiction problems going on in your map. There's some excessive friction. You need to get rid of that. So or would... spiking in the RA will, will, is an indication of that as well. So when you when you uh, generate that in the in the other application you talked about, you wouldn't see any periodic error. 
that would be your your tip off, I imagine. Right. Well, so this when you when you look at it like this, it won't show any of those intermittent errors. It only shows the periodic part. And that's the okay. beauty of this, that you're separating out here, only looking at the the sort of periodic area that you can't uh, get rid of. And then you can figure out how to guide around that. Looking at these logs, you can sort of pick up, oh, I've got an additional problem that I've got to, I've got to pick up and, 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 and repair with maintenance. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, we'll go to uh, Chris, Chris Kagey. Hey Eric, on this same topic of the of of, of getting your your um, uh, your frequency analysis for your your mount, actually, if you can, yeah. don't mind backing up a couple of slides to where you've got your two frequency analysis charts. Um, did you so to to get these initially? Are you are you doing an unguided run? Yes. With these, okay. Yes. So oh. this is, so you do an unguided and this is what it looks like in, in real time. It looks something like this. This is not a frequency. This is the actual error. Right, exactly. Yep. It's yep. a function of time. Then you take that one night, right? Unguided. Then the next morning you open up PhD log right. viewer right. and bring up that guide log. And it'll also plot this out. It'll look just like this but you can just right click on it and it'll bring up and it'll say frequency analysis. And you click right. on that and it will produce this curve. And okay. that separates then out your, your gear error. And that's what you really want to get at. Okay. And then um, follow up on this. Uh, one, can you say, remind me again, how short are you running your exposures on uh, for, for guiding on PhD2? You, you said it less than a second? For for my mount, I'm running about a half second. Okay. Okay. And you have yours. Yours maybe maybe quite different. You may be able to run much longer. For my mount, with a lot of error, I have to go about a half second, and and I have to use fairly high aggressive settings. I usually use about 0.8 or so on that. But that's mount dependent. Absolutely. And 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 you need to go through this process in order to determine that and see what's. That's going how on. I did it. Yes. Yep. Okie dokie. Thanks, sir. Okay, let's go to the chat box and we'll go to, uh, let's see, at the top. John, you had some questions. Um, I believe you're still on. John had a question about uh, kind of early in your brief, you talked about aggressiveness, I think as a function of, of a setting in PhD. And right. John was asking whether that was a function of turbulence um in terms it, of how you would decide how to set that i think right there there's um that's a good point and and that takes a little bit of a feel but there are lots of lots of parameters you can set in phd2 uh, i just talked about that but there's also something called a minimum move uh that you'll see and that is is sort of sets a floor where uh, below that floor, it doesn't make any corrections, but above that, it will start making corrections. And sort of I play with that with, depending on the seeing level, I, I can look at the deck axis and I can sort of see what uh, seeing fluctuations are going on. And then I can set that minimum move sort of so I'm not making unnecessary corrections from seeing. And, and that's the way I sort of handle that. But... Uh, there may be better ways. There's a lot of experienced users that probably have, have found ways, but that's how I, I sort of uh, go with the seeing conditions at the evening as I sort of adjust my minimum move. Okay. Uh, let's see. John had a few other ones, but let's go down the list here and try to take them in order. Chris Spain, did you get an answer? Let's see. Chris, you and Linda chatted about... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I had an assumption that there are no encoders on the cheaper mounts, but it, it seems like there's some kind of basic encoder there that lets it know its position. No, so my, my question no, was, okay. this doesn't have encoders on it. Uh, it's just, just a simple stepper motor. Okay, because my question was, how does it know with the built-in periodic error correction where it is? Like, oh, it's got it. It does it. it I, I, there is, there is a um, in in mine and our different mounts have a different. It's got a little. A little wheel 
uh, a little shutter actually attached to, I guess you could call this an encoder, but it's just one position. Uh, it's a little shutter with a slit in it that rotates and there's a little LED behind it and it's attached to your worm gear. Oh, this is only on your RA axis. And, uh, okay, so, so it always knows when it's past that point so it can restart. And, when it, and so before you start recording, it will set it so it, I guess it will center that slit over the LED, it knows where it is, then starts the record. And then it, from then on, it knows where it is. But yes, there okay. is a simple way to, so it knows where it is. It's not a full gotcha. encoder. It's just a, a very simple. It knows where it is based on extrapolation from the last light pulse, right? Yes, yes. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, that was a good question. I had the same kind of thought. I wasn't quite sure how how PEC worked that way, um, how it lined up where you ended your recording and where you were trying to play it back type of thing. Yeah, I don't know if there's a picture of it. Uh, when I opened, when I showed those pictures, uh, it's not. But it it might be that right there. See where my pointer is pointing. Yeah, there. That's. I think that's it. There's a little wheel that spins. It it's attached to this shaft. It spins around. There's a little LED down here on this circuit board that shines a light through that little wheel, and then that's where it does that registration. Uh, cool, Alan. Your question on balance. I think you had a question on. Uh, yeah, it's not a it's not a uh, a very important one, but uh, could you uh, mention your comments on how far out of balance deck might be to eliminate uh, hysteresis and declination? Oh, I that's a good. So, um, so I do unbalance both the deck axis and the R. I don't have a a set. Uh, way of doing that. Um, uh, my mount has quite a bit of friction. So the degree, the precision, which where I can set the imbalance is pretty low. Um, um, it doesn't seem to care about that excess friction and, uh, and the balance that you can feel that easily when you're rotating the gear. You can rotate it one way that you can feel out how out of balance. But I don't have a prescription because mine has so much... Um, friction in it that it's hard to balance it really accurately um, and so i don't pay a lot i just do a little bit of imbalance on both the the uh, eyepiece heavy and uh and i make it uh, east heavy um, uh, for the right ascension um, but i don't uh i don't have any I, I don't have any any real insights to that yeah okay so i guess you're saying in some of these it's not possible to overcome the the hysteresis and friction with out of balance, right? You still get hysteresis. I, I got another. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I got another related question, and that is, what do you recommend for a lube? For oh, for lube, um, and I'm not a grease expert. I just looked online like everybody else does and see pe people recommended Super Lube. It's a synthetic grease, food grade if you need it. <laughs> Uh, and it, it, it works down to about more to, minus 45 degrees C. Uh, I put it on mine. I don't go out below 25 degrees out here, so I don't know how it works. At, uh, that's sort of my limit. Uh, but it works great. It actually is tracked better in the, uh, in the winter than it did in the summer. So that seems to work for me. Uh, it's, you know, a few dollars a tube, but it's super loop. You just look it up. It's synthetic grease, and it worked well for me. Uh, and the, 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 the one other thought I had about when you thought about balancing, um, the one thing I did think a little bit was about how you balance your scope. And there are two ways you can do it. Um, um, <clears throat> what you're trying to do is, is to, you know, uh, balance the scope. This is for the right ascension axis against this counterweight. And you can either take a light weight and put it at the end of your shaft, or you can take a heavy weight and put it up near the motor. And they will both pursue the, you know, you can produce the same torque that way, which balances out whatever scope you have on the other side. And if you read online on the recommendation on that, uh, it will tell you that you should use a larger weight up near the motor. And at least for, for, and that might work for, for, for better mounts, but for 
lower mounts with a lot of friction, I would advise against that. I would actually take a lighter weight and put it near the end of the shaft. And the reason is, the reason you want to, you might want to consider putting a heavier weight up high is because that minimizes what's called the moment of inertia. And, and that's, um, you can balance something like I said, either way, but you can minimize it. I should put some charts on this, but you can minimize the, um, the moment of inertia if you use large weights higher up. And that's just when your mount is accelerating, uh, there's some inertia to that initial acceleration and that's proportional to the amount of weight and how far it is, uh, the square of how far away it is from the center of the axis. And you can minimize that. But if you do the calculation, at, at least uh, during tracking, uh, that force is minuscule. And it may be a little appreciative when you're slewing it, you know, uh, accelerating up to some high slew speed. But when you're tracking, it's a minuscule force. But by using a higher weight up near the shaft <clears throat> or up near the motor, you're adding a lot of additional friction into your mount. And if you've got a high friction uh, amount to begin with, that is far, far going to exceed any benefit of, of reducing the moment of inertia. So I would advise for less expensive mounts to use a small weight at the end of the shaft versus taking the sort of what you'll see on the web, which is to take a large weight and put it near the motor. So that's the one thought I had on that. Uh, Eric, is there any like, I guess you're, when you talk about balancing heavy or whatever, you're talking about the right ascension. Is there any strategy or technique for declination or do you just make that as perfect as you can? Well, so the problem I've run, uh, I, I do a little bit eyepiece heavy usually or, you know, you know, one side heavy. And uh, the, the reason I found on that, uh, and this may be getting to, I think it was Alan asked the question, um, is that particularly when you've got a lot of backlash in your system, right? The, the, and maybe uh, you can get sort of caught between the gear teeth um, that it's sort of going around. If, you, if you've got really good um, polar alignment, you know, it's sort of making corrections in both directions and you can get sort of in between where it's not making very good corrections in either direction. And if you balance it, uh, a little heavy, you can try to sort of weight it towards one side. Uh, and and the, the problem I've run into that when it's, when it's sort of caught in between is it can be a little unstable and something can come along, a gust of wind or, you know, you bump it a little bit and suddenly it'll fall on one of those teeth and it'll give you a big glitch um, in, in your air, um, and which you don't want. And so if I, I usually sort of balance it a little bit eyepiece heavy to try to avoid those sort of getting it caught between the teeth with a lot of backlash. But again, I, uh, that's something I, I don't have as much experience. That's just what I do. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to John here. Uh, yeah, John, uh, you've got a couple more questions. Why don't you just take them? Take them. Uh, well, uh, first uh, on what you were just speaking about uh, in land navigation, we call it heading off. When you bias your intended direction uh, slightly to one side of your target so that any corrections you have to make are all in one direction. They're always to the right or always to the left. Uh, that applies here in that if you have uh, slop in the gear, that is a little space between the teeth and, and, the, and the, the worm gear, for example, uh, it's always on one side and then you don't get that uh, rattling effect that right. you were just discussing. Right, uh, and that's what, exactly. Yeah, the, the question I had uh, later, I think, was uh, about uh, one of my gears seems to have high spots, and they seem to correspond to the two uh, set screws. And oh. I was tempted to drill another couple of set screw holes so that I could center it from all four sides or, you know, actually center it rather than push it all to one side. Push yes. To one side. And I'm not sure if that's something that uh, would allow me to reduce the amount of slop because I could cause the gears to enter uh, interface more tightly all the way around. Rather so you're than 
to ride to the top on one and then be loose on the other side. So you're talking about these two spur gears here. Is that right? Uh, yes. Or, or something like that, right? And you're going to see set screws and it's pushing you to, uh, to one side. Yeah, so that the, when I get rid of the high spot, if I can, I, and I haven't figured out how to do that because the the rigging, the the block that the axes are axles are mounted in is not adjustable. Uh, yes. But uh, if I if I can if I adjust it so that I don't get in tight spots, then I'm real loose on the other. And yeah, I got gotcha, you, got gotcha. you. Yeah, actually, what I did in my mount, um, um, and 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 that's maybe a reason to to think about. Uh, another feature in mouse, which is I actually took these two and I put a belt drive on mine. Uh, I replaced these with two pulleys and, and a little belt and um, to get rid of a few problems with these. Um, I didn't mention that here. I don't have any pictures of it, but uh, I, I actually put a little belt drive. And that's another feature some of the mounts have is a belt drive. And the, the only tricky part of doing that, well, you got to figure out what parts to order, uh, but uh, it's very simple to do because you're just moving it. You can replace it. The only tricky part is um, when, notice when this, say this gear is rotating this direction here, this direction is going in the opposite direction. So you have to if wind it around. Drive, here, right? if, you, if you put a belt drive, this goes this direction, this goes the same direction. So you have to reverse that. And the way I did it was to, um, the, I reversed some of the wires on the motor back here. Uh, so it actually drove this, this motor backwards uh, with the belt drive. And, uh, but I don't encourage you to, you don't need to do that. <laughs> That's just what I was playing around with mine. And it was an easy switch and uh, it works pretty well. The only problem I've had with it is that the belts stretch a little bit over time and sort of have to go back and tighten it. It might be more uh, temperature sensitive? Yeah, a little bit. It's, um, I, it's so easy to adjust. Uh, that in, in two minutes, I can go in and jolt, adjust the belt tension. There's just a couple of set screws here that you loosen and you can pull the motor out uh, and, and tighten you know, the belt. I can't, I can't it's, adjust it, so that's the tricky part. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I know what problem you're talking about. So you're, you're dealing with either backlash or, or, or hitting a high spot, which is binding up a little bit. Okay, we'll uh, continue. A couple more questions. I know we're holding you late here, uh, Eric. Pre appreciate your time. Chris, did you want to ask about uh, the grease again? Did you have another question on that? Oh, no, I was just kind of commenting that I, I thought about tearing down my mount in the first place because balancing is difficult. It, it almost seems like the grease in my HEQ5 is just really thick from the factory. Um, and that I don't know if that's for the cause of my balancing issues or if it's friction from something else. Uh, yeah. And mine, it was not the grease. It's actually the um, uh, uh, you, you can't. I don't have a picture, but um, when you release this clutch, this cylinder spins around in here, and this is a very tight, close fit, and um, and that's where all the friction is. And the grease did not help that. If I wanted to get rid of it, I, I thought about it. I, no, I would just go in with a little polishing wheel. I mean, a little polishing uh, brush and some fine grit polish, and I would polish that aluminum in there uh, a little bit. And I think that would take care of it. I haven't done that. It would be real easy to do. Uh, but that's where the, the the friction from balancing is, is right in here. Um, gotcha. Uh, that doesn't affect the... Uh, what you're seeing when you're actually driving them out that's that's different parts rotating but when you're balancing it's this there, there's the clutch it, it grabs against this and mm -hmm. uh, and release that that's the that's the part that's got all the friction in it you read online sometimes you know people go in and they buy the higher end grease and they replace just kind of do their grease right mm -hmm. yeah, but it doesn't sound like you would recommend that that's really uh if you were only going to do that, is it worth is it worth taking your mount apart? I well, I approached it from is it causing me problems? Now, if you want to try to reduce friction for balancing, that may be a different. I was approaching it when I did it. Would this affect guiding? And I was very systematic to that point. 
And so I went through this process, where the guiding air, where's the friction coming from, identifying those spots, and then trying to solve it. Along the way, I just happened to say, well, let me replace the grease just for whatever. But that wasn't the source of my problems. I had much bigger fish to fry. I had metal shavings floating around in here. <laughs> Things like that. So uh, okay. whether the grease had any effect, I have no idea. I sort of doubt it. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Larry, uh, and then we'll get back to John here. Larry Kuhn. Yeah. Yeah, just a quick point about the declination um, and the slop in the gears. I've always heard, and you mentioned going uh, east heavy when you do balancing and right, uh, right ascension. I've always heard that you, yeah, that you do that, and uh, I have like this magnetic weight, and oh. what I'll do is make sure that it's east heavy post meridian flip, and then I can just take that weight off, and then it's east heavy pre meridian flip so when oh, that's a good idea yeah meridian you put the weight on so that the gear is always the motor is always pushing the worm gear as opposed right. to it falling right which can create right. bounce or whatever right I'm, so i'm wondering if, with your point about declination if you're constantly guiding in a certain direction would it make sense to add weight opposite of the direction that you're guiding and declination to right. screw that out as well it probably would it would it would take some figuring out which way it's actually correcting because it's not obvious it's not like just simple east heavy um and i don't know a priori which way it's going to start guiding but if you had a magnetic thing or something you could add you could figure out which way and then just add i like that idea that's actually a, a useful suggestion yeah. Or maybe even, even try to force it so that it's deck guiding in the way that it's going against gravity, right? Which <laughs> yeah, you could adjust it that way intentionally. Up, down. <laughs> yes, you could do that. I, I that's a good good. Those are good suggestions. How much weight did you use, Larry? Like a uh, I actually picked this up from when I got my used scope. The guy that sold it to me had it. The it's about the size of a pack of cigarettes, but it's a pretty heavy weight so i'm guessing it's a half a pound maybe or a pound i don't know i'm really bad at guessing weight but it's it's not insignificant but oh, it's um 10 yeah, it, it's but... just enough it's just enough that if you have the the scope balanced out at your best way and then you slap it at the end of the um you know the the end of the the pole where you put your mount your weights on it, it significantly makes it drop on the other side. So, so yeah, I, I bounce it with the weight on at the bottom of the the weight pole so that it's east heavy. And then when I take it off, it ends up being east heavy the other direction, which is really all I care about. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It, it must be out there somewhere, you know, on, on uh, Amazon.com, I guess. But uh, I didn't have to buy it that way. <laughs> that was so, a good idea. Yeah. All right, John, maybe one last question. I think we are. Okay. Uh, actually, Larry may have uh, had the answer for what the uh, second question I asked, but uh, I was just going to note that uh, I suspect that some cheaper mount manufacturers use a heavier grease so that the uh, 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 flop in the, inter in the meshing of the gears is not so obvious. Because of May, the I, gear grease, I, and it, it could even make things worse if you put in a lighter grease or a more fluid grease in gears that don't mesh snugly. That's that's certainly true. I it, uh, I sort of thought about those sorts of things as well. But um, yeah, good point. Anybody? I, I, yeah. If I, if if I may make one quick point. Eric, since you've only been in this for a short period of time, sure. obviously you've made great, great progress, amazingly enough. Um, I've seen suggestions of using toothpaste on your gears and running them through about 20 times to get rid of the high spots and then replacing the, the toothpaste with uh, grease afterwards to help eliminate the high spots in your gears. That's another, that, so that acts like a polish, basically. Yeah. Ah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it works. So if it ruins your mouth. Why don't you try your mouth and get back to us? 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I suspect that'd be more effective with a worm gear than uh, ordinary disc gears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not sure. Yeah. So significant. I may actually try that. That sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Eric, thank you so much again uh, right. for, for filling in here. Great presentation uh, and a lot of things to think about. I think, uh, um, you know, just a real great detailed look and breakdown of, of how things work and how to make them better. So uh, really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you and your fancy AVX mount out at Crockett here shortly. <laughs> and we'll, All right. I hope we'll, to make uh, out. Yeah. And uh, so the rest of the Novak folks help us out with outreach. Uh, got a lot of cool events coming up, and uh, go 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 make a showing out at Great Meadow if you would, if you can. And the weather's good. That's our first uh, event out there this year, and I'm kind of excited about getting that going, uh, as well as the other ones. So a lot to do. And uh, as always, thanks for all the volunteers. And uh, have fun. Have a great week. And we'll see you again uh, soon. Good night, everyone. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Eric. Eric. It looks like, uh, despite Good your night. desire for a big view of the universe, your uh, first presentation included a lot of. Uh,